Hello and welcome to our first lecture, Introduction to Microbiology. So what is microbiology? I'd love if you just took a moment here and thought about this word. What comes to mind first when you hear microbiology? Feel free to pause the lecture, take a moment and think, and then come back to this next slide. When you think of microbiology, you might think about bacteria, maybe a specific type of bacteria. We've all heard of E. coli or salmonella. Maybe you think of germs or things being dirty, needing to wash your hands, or maybe things that make you sick and cause diseases. This could be like a virus, like the flu or the common cold. All of those things do belong in the realm of microbiology. But hopefully, you'll see throughout the semester, that there is so much more to this tiny world. And speaking of tiny, all of these microorganisms that belong in the realm of microbiology all share that very important characteristic. Microorganisms, or microbes as they're also called, are small organisms. So small that they cannot be seen with the naked eye. You need the help of a special instrument to help you see them, and that instrument is a microscope. On the left, we have a picture of a light microscope. So this is the microscope we'll be using in lab. You'll learn the different parts and how they work in order to visualize our bacteria in the lab. On the right is also a microscope, but it's an electron microscope. This is a much more powerful microscope that has a higher magnification and resolution compared to a light microscope. It also shoots beams of electrons, hence the name, at objects in order to collect information about the shape of that object. Our light microscope, on the other hand, uses light from a light bulb source, and that's how we're able to visualize and magnify the image. So we'll be able to see a lot of amazing things with our light microscopes in the lab, but the powerful magnification of an electron microscope allows people to see even tinier things than bacteria, like viruses. Okay, okay, so now we know microbes are tiny, but now of all the living things on Earth, what exactly is a microbe? Who belongs to that group? So this is an image of the phylogenetic tree of life. A phylogenetic tree shows evolutionary relationships among different organisms. So you can see some common ancestor down here at this node evolved over millions of years and diverged into these distinct groups or domains. So these are the three domains of life. One, two, three, we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria should sound familiar, right? And then eukarya might sound a little familiar if you've heard about the cell types eukaryotes and prokaryotes, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So back to what is a microbe? All organisms in the domain bacteria are microscopic, so all bacteria are microbes. All organisms within the domain archaea are microscopic. They're all microbes. Now eukarya, only some organisms in the domain eukarya are microbes, so they're not all microscopic. So if you see right here this little star, you are here. Humans belong to the domain eukarya. And are we microscopic? Humans are multicellular organisms. Plants also belong in this uh, realm eukarya. Animals belong in this realm eukarya. So not all of them are microscopic. You can see yourself, you can see your family, you can see your dog. We're not microscopic. We are not microbes. But we will talk about microbes within the domain eukarya like certain types of fungi, like unicellular yeast, protozoans, algae. So let's gather what we know. We know microbes are tiny, and to be called a microbe, by definition, you have to be microscopic. So this image just gives a good idea of the scale in terms of how small is small, how small are different kinds of microscopic objects. So this is a logarithmic scale. So each little notch in this scale is a factor of 10. So bacteria are 10 times smaller than red blood cells on average. 
and you can see that the light microscope we're going to be using in lab you can see let me grab my pointer you can see we're going to be looking at bacteria we're going to see red blood cells different types of animal and plant cells that's all within light microscope and then down here in electron microscope that's where we're really capturing things like viruses down to the uh, size of proteins and even molecules so all the microbes are small we're talking microns and nanometers here so microns and nanometers so that's very small they do actually take up a huge portion of earth's biomass or the percent of living mass on earth and we'll see this on the next slide it's also important to note that most microbes actually haven't even been identified yet and by that i mean over 99.99 percent of microbes on earth have not even been cultured or identified it's estimated that there are over five nonillion, and that's a five with 30 zeros, people, five, non, five nonillion bacterial cells on the planet. Isn't that amazing? Microbiology really is an incredible field, and we've only just begun to understand the critical and integral role that microbes play in our ecosystems. So the biomass of life or the biomass on the earth and this is really talking about mass so it's talking about weighing carbon of living things you'll see the unit right here gtc that stands for gigatons of carbon so we're weighing the amount of carbon in these different living organisms and we're talking about carbon because carbon is an essential building block of complex molecules it's an essential building block of organisms and so it's a useful thing to measure when we're talking when we're trying to measure the amount of different types of organisms on the planet so look at all of these units over here so this is kind of the collection of all the biomass on the earth so we have plants bacteria fungi archaea animals viruses and protists and of course humans belong to this little block right here this little block of animals but look how many of these are microbes so bacteria we know our microbes archaea we know our microbes we just talked about that but we're going to see in a moment that fungi, viruses, and protists all belong to microbes. We talked about how there are some animal microbes. And then plants, uh, a lot of this is also microbes too in the form of like algae. So plants make a huge part of the Earth's biomass. It's like 80% of Earth's biomass. And then bacteria over here, all bacteria are microbes that make up 13% of Earth's biomass. And humans, if anyone wants to pause right here and just think and make a guess, because here's the answer, humans make up 0.01% of all of Earth's biomass. So not very many humans compared to bacteria alone or compared to all of the microbes that are essential on Earth. Just a few last notes here on really what is microbiology and the topics that we're going to be covering this semester. So we're going to be talking a lot about the study of these basic life processes of these unicellular organisms. So things like cell structure and function, metabolism, where do they get their energy from, how do they use it, how do they grow, how do they get information from their genetic material to express that information and become what they are. And really, how do all these things compare and contrast to our own cells? We'll also talk a lot about microbiology in terms of its uses and benefits to humans. So in the realms of like medicine, agriculture, industry, in terms of medicine, I have the example here of penicillin. So penicillin actually comes from penicillium mold. So penicillin is an antibiotic that is created by penicillium mold. In the realm of agriculture, the example I have here is rhizobia. Rhizobia is a nitrogen-fixing bacteria that's associated with plant roots, so it's really important for the nitrogen cycle, getting nitrogen um, as a usable form for plants, and then ultimately for people too. And then in industry, the example here is fermented food, so you can think of foods like beer, wine, cheese, yeast in baking, and or your yogurt that you eat that says it has live and active cultures so that's all microbes at play 
But also microbes are important for things like food preservation and food safety and processing and storage. And there's so many other things too in different fields. So this class focuses really on medical microbiology. So we're talking about diseases, but we're also talking about um, different types of medicines and different ways that we can control microbial growth. So we won't really be talking about environmental or industry applications, but just be aware that microbiology does have this huge impact on these other areas too, and it really is very far reaching. And really the final big takeaway that I would like for you to see by the end of the semester, because even though we are talking about controlling microbes and we're talking about how to treat diseases and different types of diseases that microbes cause, is really that not all microbes are bad. So most microbes are actually beneficial. And since I mentioned rhizobia on the last slide, I just wanted to mention again that microbes are involved in processes like the geochemical cycling of elements like carbon and nitrogen. And I don't really think that beneficial really captures the importance enough, okay? They are crucial, they are critical, they are absolutely necessary. We would not be able to live on planet Earth and have access to things like nitrogen that is absolutely necessary for us to be a living organism without the help of microbes. Microbes also play an essential role in our own anatomy. They play a really important role in our gut, but we're going to see later on that they play important roles all over our body. But we would definitely not be able to survive without the help of that invisible world. Now we're going to jump back to this phylogenetic tree for a second again before we start discussing the six major groups of microorganisms. So remember that all bacteria are microbes, they're all microscopic. All archaea are microbes, they're all microscopic. And only some eukarya are microscopic microbes. So like humans are not microbes, but certain things like unicellular yeast, that's a type of fungi, certain types of algae, those are microscopic eukarya. But you'll see here that there's a new heading that has been added. So we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And this is another way to differentiate these different domains of the tree of life by their cell type. So prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells have very distinct differences between each other that we're gonna see on the next slide. But before we see that, just so you know, bacteria and archaea are all prokaryotes. And then everything in with, within eukarya are eukaryotes. So here's an image, a really good image, showing the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Remember, prokaryotic cells are all bacteria and archaea, and eukaryotic cells are all within the domain eukarya. So a prokaryotic cell, as we see down here, the uh, pro meaning before and karyo meaning nucleus, means before the evolution of a true nucleus. So that means prokaryotic cells do not have a nuclear membrane encasing their genetic material. Where over here you can see that eukaryotic cells do in fact have a nuclear envelope encasing all of this genetic material. Another major difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells is their genome. So prokaryotic cells actually have a circular genome. It's like a ring, it's like a donut. Whereas eukaryotic cells have linear DNA. So like we have 23 pairs of linear chromosomes, humans do. So that's linear genetic material compared to circular genetic material. Also, uh, generally speaking, prokaryotic cells usually have smaller genomes compared to eukaryotic cells. And most often prokaryotic cells are actually smaller than eukaryotic cells. Again, with this nuclear envelope difference though, prokaryotic cells do not have any membrane-bound organelles at all, whereas eukaryotic cells have lots of membrane-bound organelles to keep things compartmentalized and organized within the cell. So we have things like mitochondria and vacuoles and the Golgi apparatus and all of these different membranes that have different jobs within the cytoplasm. Prokaryotic cells don't have any of that organization, but they do have certain, they can compartmentalize things certain ways, but none of it is 
membrane bound. So they're much uh, simpler organisms. A few similarities between these though, of course, they both have cytoplasm. They both have membranes to encase all that cytoplasm. They both have genetic material, even though they're different shapes. And then they both have ribosomes. And ribosomes are really important for protein factories. And we'll see this later on in um, another lecture. But ribosomes are really essential for making proteins. So all living things need to make proteins. But they do have different proteins. Prokaryotic cells actually have a lighter weight protein or ribosome compared to eukaryotic cells, but they, bo they do both definitely have um, ribosomes. Now we're on to the six major groups of microorganisms. So remember this list, and if you Google this list, by the way, you might see this represented different ways, right? There's different ways we can kind of represent and group these microorganisms, but this is how we're representing it in this class. And remember, all of these are going to be microorganisms, so they're all microscopic. So we have protozoa, fungi, that's going to include our yeasts and molds, bacteria, archaea, viruses, and then some animal parasites called helminths. So these are parasitic worms. And I would like for you to take a moment here and think through of each one, pause the lecture, uh, which of these are prokaryotes, prokaryotes and which are eukaryotes. So make sure you're able to differentiate between what's a prokaryote and what's a eukaryote and then come back for this next slide. So here are those answers. We have protozoa are eukaryotes, fungi are eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes, and then animal parasites, animals should have given it away, they are eukaryotes. These helminths, these parasitic worms are eukaryotes. And then you'll see next to viruses, I have all these question marks. So what are they? Are they prokaryotes? Are they eukaryotes? So think back or go back to the tree of life, look on there and you'll see viruses are not on there. So that is the tree of life and viruses are not considered living things. So that's why they are not denoted as prokaryote or eukaryote, but viruses are absolutely relevant to human health, right? They can cause diseases. They are also part of our normal microbiota. And they are, of course, microscopic. So they absolutely deserve a spot on this list of six major groups of microorganisms, but they are not on the tree of life and they are not prokaryotes or eukaryotes. So now we're going to take a very broad overview journey through those six major groups of microorganisms. Throughout the semester, we will definitely dive deeper into each of these more, but this is just kind of an overview of what to expect throughout the semester. So first off, we have protozoa. So these are unicellular, they're microscopic, eukaryotes. And protozoa are everywhere. Protozoa can be in water, they can be in soil, they can be in us. And they have a lot of different ways of getting energy from different resources and they've really evolved to be able to live in all of these different environments. You kind of categorize proto protozoa by their ability to move, how they move. Things can be amoebas. They can have these pseudopods that are extensions of the membrane and they can kind of scoot along the surface. They can also have flagella, so like a whip-like tail to help them move. They can be ciliated and covered in these teeny tiny little hair-like projections that helps them move along. And these protozoa can live on their own, so they can be free living, independent, and they can also be parasitic. So one of the parasitic protozoans that we'll talk about is Plasmodium falciparum. And that protozoan actually causes malaria. Next up, we have fungi, another eukaryote. And this is one of those where not all fungi are microscopic. So they can be unicellular like yeast and those are absolutely microscopic. They can also be multicellular. You know what mushrooms look like, right? We're able to see multicellular mushrooms. Fungi have, and we'll talk about cell walls here coming up in the next couple slides too, because how cell walls are built or the components of cell walls are another useful way to kind of categorize these different organisms. 
for fungi, they have chitin in their cell wall. And chitin helps with the structure of the cell wall, helps give the cell their shape and maintain the shape. Fungi, kind of like protozoans, are really good at absorbing different types of organic material from the environment to use it for energy. And this is kind of a hot button topic, but I think fungi and mushrooms are delicious. Other people disagree, but some sauteed mushrooms on some ramen, fantastic. On to bacteria, which again are prokaryotes. And like I said, the cell wall is important. The structural component in the cell wall for bacteria is something called peptidoglycan. I just take a moment and say that word because it's so fun to say, peptidoglycan. So this is their structural component. And this will come up again and again as we talk about bacteria and we talk about different staining techniques in the lab. Peptidoglycan is really an important component of their cell wall. Bacteria reproduce by binary fission. So this is different from eukaryotes. So eukaryotes, think of mitosis and meiosis. Bacteria go through a different process called binary fission. And of course, bacteria are very nutritionally diverse. So bacteria can exist like almost anywhere in the world, in any environment. And so they must be nutritionally diverse. They must be able to use different types of compounds, organic and inorganic, and use those for energy in order to grow and thrive in those different environments. Next up, we have archaea. And archaea are also prokaryotes, like bacteria. But unlike bacteria, they don't have peptidoglycan. No peptidoglycan in archaea. Archaea actually have something called pseudopeptidoglycan. So it looks a lot like it, but it's not quite. And that's an important distinction between bacteria and archaea. Also, unlike bacteria, there are no known uh, species of archaea that cause diseases in humans. There are plenty of types of genera and species of bacteria that cause disease in humans, but no, no archaea cause diseases. For this reason, we really won't talk that much about archaea in this class because we're focusing on the types of microbes that are relevant to human health. Also, archaea are often found in extreme environments, so they are called extremophiles. And by extreme in environments, I mean places really hot, like hot springs, even glaciers, places that are really salty, places that are really acidic. So they have evolved to kind of live and really thrive in these extreme environments. Now viruses, and as I mentioned before, Viruses are only visible using an electron microscope. There are some viruses that do cross the line there. There's some really large viruses, but the general rule is that viruses are too tiny to see with a light microscope, and so we require an electron microscope. And as I mentioned before, viruses are considered not living. They're not made of cells. They are non-cellular or acellular. That's why they're neither prokaryotes or eukaryotes, because those are both cell types, and viruses are not made of cells. Also, they are an obligate parasite. So viruses absolutely require a host cell in order to give them the mechanisms or the building blocks, the energy required to replicate themselves. So they can't do any of that without invading a host cell. And this image right here, I just love these images of bacteriophages. So this really amazing looking structure right here is a type of virus called a bacteriophage. And we'll get to talk about those a lot once we get to the virus section. But a bacteriophage is a special, a special type of virus that specifically infects bacteria. It's a bacteriophage. And so here is the bacteriophage infecting this bacterial cell right here. Now on to helminths. So helminths, if you think back, are animal parasites. So they are parasitic worms. And this is obviously multicellular. And they're also animal parasites, so they're eukaryotes, okay? Keep that in mind. But these are definitely multicellular, okay? This, each little square is a centimeter by centimeter square. And you should be thinking to yourself, um, 
can definitely see these with the naked eye. So why are these part of microbiology? And the answer is very simple. We study helminths in microbiology because a part of their life stage is microscopic. And importantly, the infective part of their life stage is microscopic. So their uh, larvae or their eggs are microscopic, and that is what is getting into people and causing disease. So commonly, helminths are transferred via the fecal oral route. So the eggs will be released in feces, that feces will often contaminate something like water or soil. Some other person will ingest that water or soil and ingest those helminth eggs. And then those helminth eggs will hatch into the multicellular worm and make more eggs that will then be released into the feces. So helminths are definitely relevant to human health. They cause infections and diseases in humans. And the infective part of their life cycle is microscopic, so we absolutely do study them in microbiology. Now we'll have some fun talking about a very brief history of microbiology. So we'll start with the microscope, which makes sense because without microscopes we don't have microbiology. We have no golden age of microbiology, no germ theory. We would never be able to actually see the microbes and study them more closely if we didn't have a microscope. That being said, many civilizations understood, of course, that things were making people sick. Often in ancient Greek and Roman times, that was referred to as miasma or bad air. So they understood that there were these kind of invisible things around that were making people sick. Nobody saw them, though. No one was really able to understand it until a microscope came along and we were actually able to visualize these microbes. So starting with the microscope, we have Zacharias Janssen and his son Hans, and they were actually uh, spectacle makers, so they would make glasses. And they actually observed that when two lenses were put in a tube, it would enlarge things or magnify things. And Gal Galileo heard about these experiments, and he kind of worked on these principles and improved these instruments and the ability of these lenses to actually focus on things. And he pointed those lenses toward the sky and made telescopes and also made the first microscopes as well. But these first microscopes were not very strong microscopes. It still has kind of a long way to go from here, but this is the beginning of using lenses to magnify objects. Microbiology, and as we talk about the history of microbiology and the invention of the microscope, was really important for dispelling this theory called spontaneous generation. As I mentioned before, people were aware that something invisible was making people sick, right? But people didn't really understand or they didn't know how to explain things like illness and disease, where mold came from or rotting food or how maggots just seemed to appear on food. People didn't know where this was coming from. And so we have this theory of spontaneous generation that was actually developed by Aristotle himself. And it basically just states that living organisms can originate from inanimate objects. So poof, things can just kind of appear out of nowhere. And this theory was developed over 2000 years ago, printed in Greek and Latin. So of course, this is translated right here. But this theory was believed all throughout the Middle Ages, and we'll see it wasn't disproved until like the mid-1800s, so that's only about 250 years ago. So people believed spontaneous generation for a long time. And some common examples of spontaneous generation are things like dust creates fleas, maggots come from rotting, uh, from rotting meat, just poof, they just exist, bread or wheat left in a corner produces mice. So this is where what people's understanding was at the time because they couldn't see the teeny tiny microbes at play that were involved in these processes. So Francisco Reddy in the mid 1600s attempted to disprove spontaneous generation theory by performing these experiments where meat was exposed to the air in different ways or not exposed to the air. So the meat were left in the, this meat was left in containers that were either left completely open and exposed to flies, they were completely closed and corked, 
or the container was covered with gauze. And of course he showed that maggots only developed on the meat if flies had gotten to it. And of course this refuted the spontaneous generation theory because if it's spontaneous generation then shouldn't these two flasks have seen maggots also on the meat? So this refuted the theory, but at the time, no one believed Francesco. This was just considered an exception to the theory. And it was the, the spontaneous generation theory was still widely accepted at this time. Now back to some microscope stuff. So Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek is actually given the title the father of microscopy. So he actually started as an apprentice in a dry goods store. And they would use magnifying glasses to count threads in cloth. And he actually taught himself new methods for grinding down and polishing these lenses at different curvatures to give better and better magnifications. And these were the finest and the best known at the time. And so this led to him building these more powerful microscopes and led him to all of these biological discoveries that he's famous for. So he is kind of given the title of developing the first microscope because these are the first ones that were really powerful enough to actually observe microbes. And what he observed, he called we animacules. So isn't that adorable? We, we say microorganisms and microbes now, but it's too bad we animacules fell out of fashion because it's very cute. But he was the first to see and describe bacteria, yeast, a drop of water, he saw that all of these things were actually teeming with life. So he was the first to actually properly document his findings and say that there aren't only these teeny tiny things we can't see with the naked eye, but hey everyone, they're alive. So this was an enormous step towards microbiology and germ theory and understanding and being able to observe microbes. On to Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur finally dispelled the theory of spontaneous generation. And he did this by using special flasks. They're called gooseneck flasks. They have this funny shape right here. And he used these flasks because they uh, allow air in, but no dust and associated microbes. And really what sets him apart from other scientists and researchers at the time is that he did carefully controlled experiments using the scientific method. And we'll talk about that uh, toward the end of the lecture. But that's really what differentiated him. He had a lot of material that supported his findings and it was reproducible research that other people could do and say, oh yes, I found the same thing. And this once and for all showed that life absolutely did not come from nothing. Now, this is the time whenever we get into germ theory. And Robert Koch was the first to suggest that microbes were the cause of disease and proposed that microorganisms actually cause infectious disease. So as obvious as this seems to us now, at the time this was quite a quantum leap in understanding of human health and seeing that pathogens or microbes could be transmitted from one person to another, maybe from an animal to a person. And Koch formulated what's now known as Koch's postulates. And this is a set of steps that you follow to show that a particular microorganism causes a particular disease. And we'll return to this when we talk about infection and infectious disease. So this Koch's postulates won't be on the first exam, but they will, we will return to it probably for the second exam. Now we really get into this era where we understand that there are these invisible things that can cause disease. And now these different doctors, researchers, scientists are coming up with ways where we can improve human health based off of this new knowledge. So first off, Joseph Lister. So he actually used chemicals to disinfect wounds and surgical incisions. And surprise, surprise, he found that this dramatically lowered the rate of infection and death. Uh, kind of similar to that, Ignaz Philip Semmelweis. So he was a huge proponent for hand washing, which seems silly now because now we very much so understand the importance of hand washing. But at the time, he was actually given the title Savior of Mothers. So he was an obstetrician. He delivered babies. He found that the incidence of mother illness or death after childbirth 
greatly decreased if people just washed their hands and had cleaner surgery procedures. At the time, this was not well received, not well accepted, but his clinics were extremely popular at the time, and you can understand why. And then we have Paul Ehrlich. So he suggested that it might be possible to kill microorganisms without actually killing the patient. And he imagined this um, single chemical that could do that, and he called it, he actually coined the term magic bullet. He developed the use of an arsenic-containing compound that could be used to treat patients with syphilis. But because this is arsenic, of course, this drug was toxic to humans as well. But now we have so many drugs that target specific microbes, and so he was on the right path. Now we absolutely do have drugs that target microbes without killing the patient. Now on to Edward Jenner, who we will absolutely be returning to whenever we talk about vaccinations and immunization because he is known as the father of immunization. So Edward Jenner discovered that milkmaids who had contracted cowpox didn't end up catching the much more dangerous smallpox. And he did experiments by taking the pus from blisters of cowpox infected milkmaids and scratched them onto the skin of other people. I believe his first tester was the son of the gardener that worked on or near the farm. So he then exposed that boy to actual smallpox patients and then later reported that the boy never got smallpox. So something in that original inoculation with the cowpox gave him the immunity to never even get the smallpox. And this was an enormous step for understanding how we prevent microbial diseases. We've seen so much about understanding, yes, that we do we get diseases from microbes, but now how do we start preventing them? And this is where we come into the realm of vaccination. Like I said, we'll definitely be returning to this. So like I said, we were going to return to the scientific method. Uh, we mentioned it whenever we talked about Louis Pasteur and using it to disprove the spontaneous generation theory. But we're going to take a moment and just chat about it for a bit. So the scientific method has these steps involved. First, you make an observation about something. Then you form a hypothesis, and this has to be a testable statement, of course. What question do you have? What do you want to find out? Then you're going to experiment and test that hypothesis and then collect all that data. Then you'll analyze your data and draw a conclusion. Did you prove or disprove your hypothesis? Were you right or wrong, essentially? But it really doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. What's important is that you collect and analyze the data appropriately. You can always make a new hypothesis. You can make an observation from your data and make a new hypothesis and then run these experiments again. And that's kind of the idea of this cyclic uh, ability of the scientific method to kind of run through again and again and again and really narrow in on what your question is. So how you might use the scientific method in a, an everyday scenario and not even realize you're using it is imagine that you are trying to charge your phone, but your phone isn't charging. So that's your observation. My phone's not charging. So it could be that your charger is broken or maybe the outlet is broken. So you'll form a hypothesis. You'll say, if I plug in my phone into a different outlet, my phone will start charging. So you test that experiment. You go and you plug your phone into every other outlet in your house. And you collect that data and you analyze the data and find that your phone does absolutely charge in every other outlet. So you can conclude that it's the outlet that was broken not your charger. So you, in that scenario, you proved your hypothesis. So the last thing that we'll talk about in this lecture is scientific names and the importance of formatting those scientific names. So microorganisms and all organisms are classified according to their characteristics from kind of the most inclusive to the least. Because remember, there are only three domains of life. It's a very broad distinction. There's only bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And then we get more and more specific. And most organisms are named based on their genus and species names. 
So for example, the bacterium Escherichia coli belongs to the domain bacteria, the kingdom Monera, the phylum Proteobacteria, the class Gamma Proteobacteria, the order Enterobacteriales, the family Enterobacteriaceae, the genus Escherichia, and then the species Coli. And how you would denote this in a paper or a project is by always italicizing the genus and species names. So up here, always italicize. If you're handwriting it, then it will be underlined. But if it's typed, always italicize. The genus name is always capitalized, and the species name is a lowercase letter. So example, again, like Escherichia coli, we are Homo sapiens, genus Homo, species sapiens. And you can also shorten it if you've used the full version already in your report or project all other instances where you talk about the organism, you can shorten the genus to the first letter and a period, followed by this species.